we're going to bring in the CBS news story because we got to talk about censorship. Um, this one is very different. I know I've covered a lot of stories on this show about censorship, but this time this is in reference to a CBS former news reporter. Uh, she actually has testified in front of Congress. We're going to dive into this because I've told you how mainstream media they shape the narrative. The narrative comes from the State Department. Uh, these networks have shareholders like BlackRock and Vanguard that are also invested in these networks and they also kind of control the narrative. Well, apparently she didn't like being controlled. So she was fired. Fired reporter to testify, CBS News crossed red line by taking her files. And this is the reporter in question here. We'll get into the video in just a second. I'll make this a little bit bigger for the people in the back. There we go. A longtime journalist laid off by CBS News this year will speak out about her firing for the first time on Thursday at a hearing in Congress and plans to criticize the network for taking files containing confidential source information. Katherine Herridge a former senior investigative correspondent will also appear as a witness before a House Judiciary Committee subcommittee hearing on press freedom issues and say that her former employer encroached on her rights according to her opening statement obtained by the Washington Examiner. CBS News decision to seize my reporting records crossed a red line that I believe should never be crossed in any media organization. Herridge had a high profile role at CBS News in 2019. Prior to that, she worked at Fox News since the 1990s. So this is important because it makes you realize this is not a new reporter. This is a reporter that is seasoned and she's been in the field for quite some time. She became known for covering national security issues and more recently investigations into Joe Biden and Hunter Biden. <laughs> of course. Her firing became a source of controversy, controversy after several reports indicated that CBS News seized her items, including confidential source information upon her termination. Herridge plans to explain what happened to lawmakers during uh, Thursday's hearing. When I was laid off in February, an incident reinforced in my mind the importance of protecting confidential sources. CBS News locked me out of the building and seized hundreds of pages of my reporting files, including confidential source information. Now, this is interesting because if one of the stories that she was focused on was the Hunter Biden laptop story or Biden's business dealings in Ukraine, and she had confidential sources, she accidentally left those in the office and CBS went through and took her files. That means that that information could have been given to government agencies as well, and they could harass or go after her sources. So this is not okay. I do feel like they must have been spying on her. Like this is, this is crazy and this is very dangerous. It goes on to say multiple sources said they were concerned that by working with me to expose government corruption and misconduct, they would be identified and exposed. When CBS News was previously pressed by Congress on Harridge's dismissal, the network adamantly denied that it had seized her files and said it handled her termination in a normal manner. Okay, define normal. Human Resources Department staff retrieved Herridge, Herridge's uh, personal belongings from her office, such as books, clothing, and awards to return to her. But at no time did anyone review any of the files or other materials. That's coming from a CBS News representative, and that's what they wrote to Congress. Contrary to several false press reports, absolutely none of Ms. Herridge's files were seized. Rather, CBS acted to secure and protect the material in her office. The representative said, adding that the network returned her items after her union, the Screen Actors Guild American Federation of TV and Radio Artists, took issue with CBS News about the matter. 
Harridge's concerns about her termination also come as she appeals a judge decision in February to hold her in civil contempt for refusing to unmask the source of a series of reports she did at Fox News on a scientist's alleged ties to the Chinese military. So again, this goes to show you about the lack of protection that reporters and journalists have in this country. Like, yes, a source is something that is supposed to be confidential unless that source volunteers to come forward and say, no, I want to come forward out in the open. Most of the time it's confidential, especially when you're dealing with corruption uh, that's high level, such as the president of the United States. People want to protect their self. People want to protect their family members. So there's that. And the fact that you have these networks trying to uncover who these sources are, well, that takes us back to the Twitter files hearing that Matt Taibbi had in front of Congress, where they were asking him, who was your source? Who did you get this information from? And then they basically interrogated him because he was refusing to give up that information. It goes on to say the judge imposed the 800 per day fine on Herridge until she provides the name of the source who disclosed to her private information about the scientists. But the fine is paused while the appeals process plays out. I don't even think this is a judge did this. This is why I say the legal system is not fair. When you go through major life events, as I have in recent weeks, losing your job, your health insurance, having your reporting file seized by your former employer and being held in contempt of court, it gives you clarity. And that's another reason why I would argue and say your health insurance should not be attached to your job. Let's get into the hearing. So shout out to Hotspot for this. Hotspot is doing the damn thing. Follow them on Twitter. Follow Hotspot. Catherine Herridge testifies that CBS News locked her out of the building and seized her files. Let's go ahead and get into this clip here. So this is her testimony in front of Congress. As you know, in February, I was held in contempt of court for refusing to disclose my confidential sources on a national security story. I think my current situation can help put the importance of the Press Act into context. One of our children recently asked me if I would go to jail, if we would lose our house, and if we would lose our family savings to protect my reporting sources. I wanted to answer that in this United States, where we say we value democracy and the role of a vibrant and free press, that it was impossible, but I could not offer that assurance. The Bipartisan Press Act, which came out of this House committee, would put an end to the sort of legal jeopardy that I have experienced firsthand in the federal courts. And without the legislation, more journalists will run the uncertainty of the contempt gauntlet in the future. This legislation will provide protections for every working journalist in the United States, now and for the next generation. The legislation provides strong protections at the federal level for reporters and their sources. It would block litigants and federal government from prying into a reporter's files, except when there's an imminent threat of violence, including terrorism and in defamation cases. At the state level, similar rules are already in place to protect press freedom. It is my sincere hope that the passage of the Press Act will provide similar protections at the federal level. I hope that I am the last journalist who has to spend two years in the federal courts fighting to protect my confidential sources. My current situation arises from a Privacy Act lawsuit. I am only a witness in the case. It is not common for these cases to reach the stage of holding a reporter in contempt, but when such cases happen, they have profound consequences, impacting every journalist in the United States. Forcing a reporter to disclose confidential sources would have a crippling effect on investigative journalism because without reliable assurances of confidentiality, sources will not come forward. The First yep. Amendment provides protections for the press because an informed electorate is at the foundation of our democracy. Let me just pause here for just a second about something that she said without that protection of confidentiality, that sources would not come forward. 
I think that's what they're trying to stop. I think they're trying to intimidate and they're trying to basically force sources from coming forward about corruption. They're trying to stop people from coming forward to reporters, to journalists about corruption of high officials, be it Jeffrey Epstein, be it the Hunter Biden laptop story, you know, think about what happened with Glenn Greenwald. Why did Glenn Glenn blah blah blah? Why did Glenn Greenwald leave the intercept? Because they wouldn't allow him to publish the Hunter Biden laptop story. So think about this, guys. I think that's what they want to stop. They want people to feel intimidated so that they don't come forward. Think about the Boeing whistleblower that we talked about a couple of weeks ago. This guy's gone, right? So this guy has been like cooperating for years. And then all of a sudden now he's, they, they got rid of him. So that's what they want to prevent. They want you to be intimidated. They want you to be afraid because they don't want you to come forward about this information. If content forces are not protected, I fear investigative journalism is dead. Each day I feel the weight of that responsibility. As you know, I was held in contempt of court for upholding the basic journalistic principle of maintaining the pledge of confidentiality to my sources. I have complete respect for the federal court and the judicial process, and I'm not here lit to litigate the case. It will play out before the appellate court in Washington, D.C. But the fact that I have been fighting in the courts for two years and that I am now facing potentially crippling fines of $800 a day to protect my reporting sources underscores the vital importance of the Press Act. When you go through major life events, as I have in recent weeks, losing your job, losing your company health insurance, having your reporting files seized by your former employer and being held in contempt of court gives you clarity. The First Amendment, the protection of confidential sources, and a free press are my guiding principles. They are my North Star. When I was laid off in February, an incident reinforced in my mind the importance of protecting confidential sources. CBS News locked me out of the building and seized hundreds of pages of my reporting files, including confidential source information. Multiple sources said they were concerned that by working with me to expose government corruption and misconduct, they would be identified and exposed. I pushed back, and with the public support of my union, SAG-AFTRA, the records were returned. CBS's News' decision to seize my reporting records crossed a red line that I believe should never be crossed again by any media organization in the future. Let's pause here for a second, because, of course, we cannot forget about this. D.D. London says, how would stories such as Watergate get seen in today's world if reporting sources are undermined? Julian Assange is the real hero here. Yes. Yeah, so here's the thing. And we've been trying to warn people about this, you know, since Julian Assange, that they were going to come for everyone. It wasn't just going to be about Julian Assange. You know, after Julian Assange, there was Daniel Hale. There have been several political prisoners. When we're talking about freedom of press here, that is a serious issue, whether you are a part of press or not. They're trying to control the source of information and they're trying to control all of the information and present only the narrative that they want you to see. This is why they wanted to have some type of restriction on TikTok. It's not just because they're getting this information uh, on TikTok because of the Israel history and they're getting misinformation about Israel and the Palestinian people on TikTok and TikTok's dangerous because China's controlling it. So we got to do something about that and get rid of it. It goes further than that. That was actually the TikTok going for the TikTok bill. That pressure was initiated by the ADL, the Anti-Defamation League. Right. So you have powerful organizations, you have powerful people, you have shareholders, you have companies like BlackRock, Vanguard, State Street Group, et cetera, that really do want to control the type of information that you get. And they really want to control the narrative. So it started with this is why when people said they were tired of hearing about Julian Assange and they're like, I don't want to know about this. 
Now you're starting to see the effects of that. This is why it was so important that Julian Assange should be freed because they basically are trying to make an example out of him. Now she isn't facing imprisonment like Julian Assange is, but you see how they're coming after everybody now. Litigation and being held in contempt have taken a toll on me and my career. This is not a battle you can fight alone. I am grateful for the support of fellow journalists and multiple First Amendment organizations, including the Reporters Committee for Press Freedom, the Freedom of the Press Foundation, the Coalition for Women in Journalism, the Knight First Amendment Institute, the Society of Professional Journalists, as well as the Columbia Journalism School, of which I am a graduate. I have also been fortunate to have the support from my former employer as I continue to fight this case. Not many journalists could count on a former employer, in this case Fox News, to support a costly and vigorous defense of the First Amendment. That is why the Press Act comes at the right time when independent journalism and news platforms are expanding opportunities for reporting diverse voices that strengthen our democracy. I know I join many journalists who are encouraged by the recent comments of the Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, who said he hopes to have the legislation through the Senate and on the President's desk this year. I deeply appreciate the committee's commitment to this legislation and holding this public hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Herridge. Ms. Cal you know, I think the unfortunate part is that she actually trusts that uh, Congress is going to do the right thing. I don't. I think that's the difference between me and her. And now it's not just about her as well. We're going to bring in this clip here. Journalist uh, Cheryl Atkins Atkinson says her experience at CBS had the U.S. government intervening in news coverage every day. Pressured by Congress, the White House and intel agencies on what the outlet should or should not cover. I told you they were controlling the narrative. Ms. Atkinson, what's your, what's your uh, experience? Well, I think it's interesting to hear people say, and I agree with this, that the government should not be intervening in news coverage. But in my experience at CBS, that happens every day. Members of committees, so. heads of committees, members of Congress and the White House call the bureau in Washington, D.C., contacts that they have. Uh, editors and managers up in New York to try to shape our coverage. Well, that, 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 that I don't find. I told you. See, he's got to interrupt you there because, oh, no, 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 we can't let that get out. I told you that's what the government has been doing. And not just, you know, members of, of the White House or of Congress. Also, the FBI, the CIA, they're all in on it. They're all in it. So they are the ones they're telling these news, these networks, what they can and cannot do. It was revealed a couple of months ago by the intercept that CNN actually had to get approval from the state of Israel on any new story that was covered in relation to the Israel Gaza conflict. They had to get approval from them before they could move forward with that. story. What does that tell you? Let's go back before uh, this guy chimes in because he's not happy. To try to shape our coverage. Well, that, 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 that I don't find particularly objectionable as is, 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 is long as there is no uh, force or threat of force behind that. D do you find that to be the case? Or, I don't know or, what or was said. There? I just know they called. There was no, no physical force threatened, but there certainly is a great deal of pressure, you know, weighing on the network's in terms of their coverage. Well, uh, uh, what about uh, government acts directly? Uh, have you encountered such intimidation yourself directly from the government or is that all, all kind of channeled through your employers? Well, I felt a great deal of pressure channeled through my employers. You know, we, I was told that certain stories weren't gonna air because we were getting phone calls and even though there was nothing wrong with the stories, let's just let it rest for a day. Let's pick it up another time. They're really mad this time. And there was no objection over the content of the story or the facts. It was they just, as I was told, they just didn't like it or it was a story that they felt was unfavorable at times. Well, I mean a story that they felt was unfavorable. So here you have an employee of CBS News testifying to Congress telling you that there were government officials contacting the network and telling the network that there are certain stories they did not want them to cover for whatever reason. 
but also stories that were not favorable coverage of the current administration. That's not news. That's propaganda. And that's what CBS News, NBC, MSNBC, CNN, Fox News, that's what they are. It's propaganda. This is why more people are watching independent media. This is why the ratings for those networks have continued to decrease, decrease over time because people see you guys are lying. So here we go. Aye, aye, aye. If, if, if they were if they were offering uh, additional facts that might have been ignored, if they were offering different opinions, uh, that, that's freedom of speech. But if behind those suggestions was the, the threat of force, that's a completely different matter. Do you, do you agree? Yeah, my position was when political officials call into the newsroom, there should be a policy where we tell them if they object to something or have a factual uh, issue that they should put it in writing and send it in. But there are these extensive conversations that go on behind the scenes. I only know about a few of them, um, a relative few of them. I'm sure they happen in other scenarios as well. Is that this, uh, <clears throat> should I read your testimony or hear your testimony to say that the press act would not be sufficient? I think it's a global problem that has to do with sending a message to a message of oversight to the intelligence agencies that we know have for decades violated rights and, and pol made policies that are contrary to constitution and so on. I don't think there's been an effort they think is serious. I feel like the intelligence agencies feel like they're running the committees here rather than the committees conducting oversight of them. And that there needs to be something they understand that they would be held accountable when they do things. And I don't know what that looks like in practice, but I don't think the law is in the and this is exactly what Matt Tybee was trying to warn people about when he first released the Twitter files. Whether you agree with the information that was released or produced or not, at this point, let's just put that to the side, that's irrelevant. The message that was being delivered is that the US government should have no right and no power to intervene and contact social media platforms, news stations, the press and tell them what they can or cannot report and what narrative they're allowed to have. That should not happen. And so when this all started with the Twitter files, I tried to tell you, it's not just about Twitter. Then later on, we started to see the pressure on TikTok. Before Twitter, it was Facebook. So we have to remember it, Going back to Facebook Facebook, and that interview with Mark Zuckerberg and Joe Rogan, he told Joe Rogan that the FBI contacted him and told him to suppress the Hunter Biden laptop story. So it didn't start with Twitter. I think it started with Facebook, but it was only a matter of time before they would have come after all of these platforms, right? And tell them what they can and cannot do or what they can and cannot say, what stories they can't cover but they've been doing this to news networks forever, as long as I can remember. Controlling the narrative and having Americans believe that when they're watching cable news, they're watching the news that these people are actually telling them news that is not biased and that is true. This is why I was so I guess furious <laughs> when talking about the Twitter files and people would say, who cares? It's just Twitter. I'm not on Twitter. That's besides the point. The point is they're trying to control what you get to see here and, and, and think they don't believe that you can think for yourself and make a correct decision. They want to tell you what you should think. They want to tell you what you should believe. Dangerous times. Like it's 2024. And we are going closer and closer back towards McCarthyism tactics. Think about that, folks. Would you be able, would you be able to publish Watergate today? What about the Pentagon Papers? These are things we got to think about.
This is why I get so passionate about this. Thank you for the super chat, brother John. The media spent the last of eight years calling Trump a racist. Say it enough times, the uninformed will believe it. Love your podcast. Thank you, brother John. They don't call Biden that though. Uh, Colin says testifying at Congress is just for the records. Congress is very corrupt, all paid by corporations. I agree. Thank you, Louise. Did she mention Assange? Yes, protect sources and I support her, but at least she isn't in Belmarsh. That is a good point, Louise. I'll have to go back and watch that full, the hearing is very long. I have to go about, back and watch the full thing to see if they even mention Assange. Uh, Yin Yang says, this is going to be a classic episode of Sabi because this is going to remain a very important issue going into the future. Oh, thank you, Yen. Uh, and thank you, David. Three channels of state media is still state media. That's right. That is right. 